We all have. Well, you've heard the phrase, the block is hot, or the million dollar block, or we don't fight over building blocks, we fight over blocks of buildings to make millions of knots. Well, all jokes aside, no, no exaggeration, uh, we're on French Road between Mack and Canfield. This, this is French itself, right? This is French Road. Um, on the east side of Detroit, and we were estimating that him and Eddie Jackson Jr., this is Courtney Brown Jr., uh, he initially estimated 20 million, and then we were doing the math, and we were like, no, more like 100 million gross, that's not profit, but they probably, their different crews over that 20 year stretch, probably counted 100 million dollars. 100 million, we touched the, yeah. Touched so, so where are we at? How did, this is not the house, it's a vacant lot uh, next door. 3875. And, and, Go, I want you guys, I got the info card right there where we talk about 277 Geneva, which was our earlier building, which weirdly enough is where my father grew up at, and I grew up two blocks away in Highland Park on Hamilton, so we talked about that. That's the early to mid-80s. Right. So how does this this block on French Road get going? Actually goes back to uh, Geneva. So, Eddie and them big run, that 18 months after his father gets out, um, 83 to 85, they light up the city with Wakefield, with Pep, that whole deal, right? So they catch the indictment. Eddie relocates to Geneva. He started hustling. Demetrius helped him out financially a lot. Then eventually Demetrius gave him a bag to start working about 86. 86, 87. What, what did he give? How much? A couple keys or something? You know, he started them off because Eddie was still... Oh, but you guys had one of the first, like, $20 rock spots at that 277 at, at Geneva. Geneva. We had banged Geneva. It just, yeah, had been stupid. Um, and then Pops is doing good because we got the thing coming out the Bahamas, and that's like 86 to 89. And how much volume was that? Pops is bringing in about... 10 keys a week from the Bahamas. So he could have probably done more, but he was breaking it down, right? Yeah, he was breaking it down to him and Fat Frank, and then... Um, were they cooking it, or was it powdered or they were cooking it? They was cooking it. They was cooking it. And so what, what, back, do you remember, like, what, was any cut put on it? Was it turned, was it cooked right? No, if you remember 87, man, well, that's 12, when the yeah. streets was flooded, and oh, the God. price was, you know, the price of keys, because we was getting them for 13, 13, 5. And that wasn't that much cheaper than what they were going for. It wasn't. You can you know, even at 13, 13, 5, you can only still make about thousand, two thousand. I mean wholesale, yeah. Wholesale. Because I Pops never why. liked wholesaling though. Yeah. It never made any to him or me, it never made any sense to me to handle that kind of volume and only be making twenty percent. Especially when six hundred and fifty grams you get your life no parole. And then they came out with that crazy law, right? Okay. So this so, place happens out. So Eddie gets burnt out. I mean, literally, him in the cat and mouse game with the Highland Park Police Department. <laughs> Shout out to Yap. Shout out to Ponytail. Ponytail. Quaker. That whole crew. They just didn't have it with Eddie. Well, and didn't they, Yap become the mayor? Yap became the mayor. That's right. Yeah. You know, uh, my rapper friend's uh, male relative feels that Ponytail. In the, in the driveway of his one of his relatives, like really, yeah. wow, for pay for the pay pay. Well, them uh, they was horrible. They, I mean, that summer, but without getting all distracted. But yeah, they used to come by Geneva and harass us, take our money, take our jewelry and shit. Now the money was all turned into evidence, right? <laughs> you know what? We didn't go follow up to forfeiture your laws. And they never get sent us any paperwork. They didn't, paperwork. Any paperwork? Any they didn't paper. come in the mail? They didn't nothing came in the mail. Okay. <laughs> so, cat and mouse game. I'm in New York. After, I moved to New York in 87. Eddie's still doing his thing on Highland Park. I'm helping Pop get the money to back to the Bahamas. 87, 88, 89. Eddie's still doing his thing in Highland Park. Finally, Highland Park, Yop, Quake, and Pony telling them tell Eddie, basically, we tired of playing this game with you. Every time we see you, we pulling you over. Literally, told him it's over. 
We're not gonna play this cat and mouse game. You know, they've been running, raiding, running, raiding, running, raiding. In 89, my pops gets violated because he didn't got heat from this Bahamas thing. Parole violation. Parole violation. We got infiltrated. Broad, we were serving. We did some sideways shit on our own out in D.C. Feds pop her. She about to tell on everybody. Now the rule of the game, rule of the game. She don't tell on us. But she know the plug down in the islands. Right? We, she was someone that met him obviously through you. Yeah. Through you guys. Yep. And um, so Pops, like, you fucked up. I got to tell my people that our shit didn't get raggedy up here. Because he old school like this. So he just told, he told old boy the truth. He like, leave it's over. Alone, leave right? us alone. We fucked up. Right. I can tell you we got, we've been, my, we got infiltrated. We got problems internally. And you need to leave us alone. And, um. Then right behind all that shit. How did he did he get violated or no? He so behind that shit they run they raid his apartment on six months. Oh, that's when he got the gun case and he that's did like he a year or two. Eighteen months. And then he gets out. Right, but that's that eighteen month period that lead to French Road. So because you got now Eddie old man locked up, he been banned from Highland Park. My pops then got locked up. I moved back from New York. And me and him clicked Where back. you had been money laundering. Where I had been money laundering, getting the money down to the islands. And me and him clicked back up. And he like, Junior, we kind of fucked up. Now, we ain't been in this situation since we was kids. Both our parents, both our daddies locked back up. Mom had just got the legitimate business going. So it wasn't making enough money to survive us with the lifestyle. You had grown accustomed. That we had grown accustomed to. So Eddie said, you know, Junior, um... I think we could set up shop over there at my cousins and them on French Road. I said, well, you used to go, uh, where you and the hut used to go and buy Vescaline at? He like, yeah. Dennis, shout out to Dennis Richardson, shout out to Kurt Richardson, Alvin Richardson, Wani Plu, Black Jesus, Giggle Rock. He say, um, I think we can set up over there. But I'm like, we ain't got no work. Shout out to the big homie. We got a dear close friend of ours. Knew the situation we was in, knew both our daddies were sitting down. And he's, he cut into us, we didn't even cut into him. He used to be a different time in the streets. And he was like, check this out, I know y'all a little fucked up right now. Why don't you take this half a break, just see. Of H? No, no. Oh, cocaine. Okay. 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 And see if y'all can get something going. It's, it's 90, you've been ran out of Highland Park. My old man been, um, my old man been Violated on a gun charge. The Bahamas plugged and fell apart. Uh, okay, you was that DJ killer. So, right, we struggled. You gave Hood, we gave Hood a shout out. For those who know, Mac and B-Wick kind of is, is ground zero for the action. Oh, that's the beginning. That's the for beginning. For me, on the east side, the first place was Eric Hood Tire Shop. Okay, so then, we call we call in all the stops we can to get some help because we catching hell. We, we know we got a break coming, but... The break ain't come. You know, between your, as I was saying, between your old man, my old man, all the family and friends we know, we figured something coming. But as you say, it's a cold winter right now. It's, it's, it's fucked up, to be honest, ain't it? Oh, it's real cold. <laughs> <laughs> so we bring in... 20 God, below style. <laughs> it's real God, cold. God rest it. So we bring in DJ Killer. Your family. We and need DJ workers. Killer we need used workers. to work for this guy in the projects named Best in the World. So DJ Killer had that mentality <laughs> of a project nigga, you understand? Because he worked for best in the world. So when he come on the east side with us, you know, he had that mentality guy. Project mentality. He brought the project mentality. mentality. So DJ do what he can to help out the situation. But but to be honest, we struggling. Again, our friend didn't help us out as you went. It, and I, I, take, I take blame for that benzo shit. Because you asked me. He was like, Juice. We can stretch it out like this, but you really always, you, you knew more than me. You was more in the quality, but I'll be honest, See, my greed. you want to give motherfucker big ass <laughs> Benzo rocks. And I was telling him, look, man, give them straight drops. The rocks going to be smaller, but this quality can't. But you want to blow it up. But so I'm greedy. I'm going to follow greedy. you down the rabbit hole. <laughs> so I, I did. I pressured my man. I was like, no, Jack, we can stretch it out. Yada, 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 yada. He know better, but he go along with me. And listen at me. We done fucked up.
The problem is the shit got, I, we took some great shit that uh, Big Homie had gave us and turned it into garbage, fucking with that benzo. And that killed the reputation of the spot. Mm. Then we gotta go recook off all the benzo off the shit, <laughs> get some more work from Big Homie, recook all this shit again. We just going back. It's a science project. It's a science project and we going backwards. <laughs> and we going backwards 100 miles per hour. Finally, we get a decent thing going, man, but it's just slow. I mean, when I say slow, we doing like $300, $400 a day. Oh, that's not even... It ain't about it. Yeah, we spent the money food, eating. Yeah. We yeah. spending the money eating. And um, I said, man, you know, after about two months of that shit, I said, Jack, let's call Eddie Jr. I said, Jack, man, this shit ain't, it ain't enough for both of us, man. I was like, I'm gonna go do something else. So it didn't two months in as you're still at under 500 bucks a day. Still under 500 a day. I mean, we had some glimpses of hope it might do 354. Um, but people, it's, um, it's again, it's the East Side is just a lot of competition. And, and there here. was no vibe, like no one had a problem with you setting up, or you weren't making enough money to. No, he just reminded me a good story. So, some young enterprising guy who was hustling at the end of the block, he came down here. And he didn't know who he was, right? And he come down here all guerrilla style. Me and Eddie on the porch. And he just gonna stop in front of the spot, start talking crazy. Y'all can't be rolling over here on French Road. This is my motherfucking block. Now I'm looking, cause I know how Eddie is. I'm definitely, like father, like son. I'm definitely the more mild mannered. Cause I'm just like thinking to myself, nigga, you're gonna get hurt. Cause if you was about anything, you wouldn't be doing all this talking. This is what I'm thinking to myself. Eddie look at me, I look at him. Eddie step off the porch and step the porch. He said, let me tell you one motherfucking thing, nigga. We hustle where we stand. You need to ask somebody. Don't you ever come back to this house again. Old boy came with the rah-rah. All right, all right, I'm going to show you. I'm going to be back. And I guess he asked around. That nigga came back the next day talking about, hey man, you know, that shit was a real misunderstanding, man. <laughs> that shit was a real misunderstanding. We good? I think we end up giving that nigga back later on down the road once we got, he ended up working with us. But yeah, so he was the only really, but yeah, we weren't making enough money to bother yeah, nobody yeah, who yeah. was about something. Yeah. And um, I went off and actually squared up, got a little powder hustle going, got a gig. Squared up means a job. A job, a job. It's because you had a college degree. College degree, you know, and a good resume. You know, I ran some big shit in New York. An upstanding young gentleman. Upstanding young gentleman. Paper. Because. You know, mom always insisted that I work. Hey, as she should. Right, because she would be like, even though the allowance, I literally for a lot yeah, of too years. Too much for a young man with all free time and money in his pocket is. She knew that was a disaster. Fast. Recipe for disaster. Fast. And that at least since his old, his old man's giving him $3,000 a week allowance. The hell did you do with all oh, drugs? Drugs and women. Yeah. That's a lot Lifestyle. of money back then. That's my back Plus, then. you were making your own money. Plus, I'm making, plus, I'm working. You know, first me at all, he just, Jack, I give you credit, man. You know, you were bad, and you just was like, we like, we just gonna fight it out till it get better. I decide, I'ma go, I'ma let, I'ma let it be. He, he ain't said nothing. I just tell man, Jack, I got this opportunity out here in Troy, fucking with these white folks. I'm gonna go on and do that, you know, and try to maybe hustle me a little powder out there with them, and, and you know, I figure I'll make a way. And I, Cause I'm just looking, I'm figuring we got 18 months to go, man, come home, and I'm figuring something to break before then, and you said, well, go I ahead. said in my mind, see, this is how he thinking. <laughs> in my mind, I'm saying, I'm gonna go up here to the penitentiary that pops <laughs> and put a bug in his goddamn head. <laughs> I need some good work. That's right. So I made my way up to Milan, Cause Pops, <clears throat> at that time, let me explain this to you. When you come in the system, you either gonna come in at Milan and they gonna ship you out, then they bring you back to Milan before you come home. Pops was finna be shipped out again or he was either there in court. Long as you go to court, you'll stay there. But after your court, all the, you know, uh, appeals and all that stuff, they gonna ship you out. So I shot up to Milan and put a bug in Pops here and he said, you know what? I got a little boy out there doing good now, but you can't go over there and he fucking up. <laughs> now you understand. So this is maybe about, there. now this is what he was trying so, to figure out the timeline. Because the man you're speaking about is Demetrius Holloway. Exactly. Eddie, you know, to his credit, when I tell him right here, literally we're standing right there, and I tell him, man, I'm going to go on the square. I can get me a good thing. They're going to let, I can run this restaurant. Because I'd already started putting in some applications. 
I was like, I got a good thing. They they willing to hook me up out at the Marriott out in Troy on Big mm. Beaver. I was running a seafood restaurant out there. Oh, that became what's it now? Um, oh, now it was a Shula's then. Before it was Shula's. Oh. You're thinking about it, it became Shula's. Before that it was called Stacy's. Oh. It was internally ran by the Marriott, oh. and um, and we had the NBA contracts. So it was a good deal. I got to meet Jordan and all kind of people, Barkley, because they had the NBA and NFL contract at the Marriott. But anyway, so Eddie tell me, man, you should hang in there, Junior. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. I said, man, it just ain't enough for both of us, man. I was like, you, you'll figure it out. You're a hustler. You'll figure it out. I'm like, and I did. I believed he would figure it out. I didn't know it would all. Un I didn't know that I was about to walk away from a 50-50 partnership on a spot that over the next 20 years was going to gross $100 million. I did not know that that's what I was walking. Perseverance. So I, I, I go off to the Marriott. I ain't lying now, maybe 90 days later. I'm talking to my man, Rome. He says, so you heard what happened, right? I said, what you mean? He say, uh, they say your man Eddie hooked back up with one of his pops friend, this cat named Demetrius. So you and get to Demetrius' blood. To 90. Right, so I walk away 90, so you may be the old man put you back with D, what? After six, seven months on French Road? It was within a year. 90, that was about the end of my two years of doing nothing. I was begging to get back in the game because I was running with our friend. Yeah. That's why I was running with him because Pops didn't want me in the game. So I'm going to be smart enough. I got another little plug. So I'm going to go to our boy and yeah. get it from him. And after all this shook down and ran down, I ran back to the penitentiary Look, Pops, I'm ready to go. I ain't <laughs> got my head no straight. More. I ain't getting high no motherfucking more. I'm through with them goddamn 51s. Now turn me loose, goddamn it. Now two weeks after that, he ran me around for two weeks. I ran every goddamn way you could run looking for Demetrius. I went out on Nine Mile to the clothing store. I went to the 19th hole. I went to his mother clothing store on Livernoy. He ran me every goddamn where he could for two weeks. And at that, about the end of two weeks, Pops called me that morning and said, you'll be at your mother's house about 12 o'clock this morning. That's at 12 o'clock that afternoon. And he called me about 9, 10 that morning and said, you'll be over at your mother's house about 12 o'clock this afternoon. And see, this go right into the story we was talking about with Black Butch the first time I got came from Demetrius. That's how it all came about. He came over to my mother's apartment on Barlidge Gave me the key, gave her the ten thousand, and that's the first well, time tell you I ever got my anywhere. recollection. Right, so now I'm I'm doing my thing out the way. You folks didn't left. I didn't left, but I'm away. coming by. I'll come by after work. Yeah, I'll come by the spot. Know, I, I don't you know. Nigga, I no, you, you don't. Let me let, let, let me tell you who tell me. Another move. brother Rome, because you know niggas talk. Yeah, Rome. So fifty already talking. Rome. When I catch Rome, I'm kind of feeling some kind of way because Rome knows something. 50 knows something that I don't know. So, but niggas can't keep a secret. So, Rome tell me, he say, so damn, I know we got to hurry up and catch up to Eddie. I'm right behind. I mean, what, what, what you saying though, Rome? Rome, like, you ain't heard. So I got to kind of play possum. I'm like, what you, I mean, I ain't heard, but let's make sure we talk about the same thing. I trick Rome by acting like I have know what he talking about, but don't know. And Rome said, because you know, his man, his daddy man that gave him that bird, he got a key over there now. Oh, shit. Why Rome tell me that? Fridge Row wasn't going to be able to get rid of me again. <laughs> um, and so once D, so I done walked away now. I come running back to French Road. I'm like, for real, homie? Street's talking. What you going to do for your man? I ain't no bullshit. That was just... Pulled out, I just I can remember like yesterday. I pull up. How long did you last at the Marriott? About eleven months. Oh, okay. That, that was good, right? Yeah. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that was good. Um, I pull back up on the spot. I'm like, Eddie ain't told me you'd hook back up with D. He like, yeah, yeah, Junior. So I didn't even have to ask. He was like, what you want, man? He always did right. It's by a me. total drought at this time. Yeah. And this is the time my friend K H K. Him in Harlem, they came by in a black Mercury McCoy. Now these boys hustling right Harlem. around the block from you, ain't they? Oh, they had the nickel houses kicking ass, but they couldn't get no cane. He come over and said, Eddie, we can't get no cane. 
I said, well, how much money you got? He said, we got about $5,000. I said, well, you want some cash? He said, we want $5,000 worth. Can you get it? I took him right in the bedroom. Of course, we were standing in the front room. I took I him in the remember. bedroom. I had just broke a key down and I opened the drawer. I had the whole key in the drawer. I pulled open the drawer and I said, you want the 5000 I had the scale right on top of that. I weighed out the cane, gave him the $5,000 worth, put the rest of the key up. Later on that night, he was right back after they flipped. Let's cut to the chase. What you want? I said, man, I ain't really been doing nothing. Just give me an AP, man. He was like, bet. Come back. Come back in an hour. I got you. And he did. And what did you do with that? You sold it? Oh, you were selling powder? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Out at the hotel or yeah. just around? Yeah. Okay. Mostly, mostly the hotel, but you know, I know people. Yeah. Partiers, no partiers. Yeah. And I was sniffing enough of this shit. I, you know. <laughs> um, but so Demetrius, you know, and Eddie started making these fucking dimes that were the size of golf balls with that Demetrius plug. I mean, he so he was doing with Demetrius ten, fifteen thousand dollars a day in dimes. Now, when yeah. something has that volume of traffic, it's not uh, two hundred crackheads spending fifty dollars. I mean, it's a lot of people doing double ups, drug dealers coming and spending four or five hundred dollars, right? It was a hustlers. It was a simple hustler's dream. Moral of this story, though, mm -hmm. I didn't walk away from this. 50% partnership. But I done decided that I can't wait no longer for it to kick off. My partner puts the shit together. And now I'm looking at, and then you start making them, uh, now you start with, when the D, you went to dimes. You went to dimes. But the dimes, the boy that was putting out there was the size of a baseball. So it didn't take long. It didn't take long at all. Yeah. Once you got that bag, French Road. It was it. The yeah. number one crack house in the state of Michigan. <laughs> voted by the Detroit News and Free Press. No doubt about it. Because again, he put could out Could you dimes come and buy a dime? You could come and buy a dime. But that would have just been neighbor. It was a, most of the business was people buying. Me or Al? Al. Oh, oh, uh. <laughs> yeah, take my number. See? We just live on the block. Hey, Omar, I'll be calling you. Out. Text me. Sorry about that. Okay, All just right. shoot me a text. Okay. Yeah, it's real in the D. When you with a celebrity, two celebrities. Two. <laughs> now the question is. What does that young gentleman want to do? It doesn't yeah. involve a Rico violence. <laughs> uh, you ex we escaped to Rico. Why throw everything away over ego? Thanks. <laughs> okay, so it's it's 91. He's doing 91, 15 a grand a day. In dimes. But it's like I say, most of it. Because well, the dimes are so big. So I mean, when I say 20s. golf balls, it ain't much exaggeration. So people buying them, splitting them, cutting them, taking them back to the west side, taking them back. The Grand Rapids or oh, wherever, yeah, selling whatever. them for fifties or sixties, all of that type of shit. It's going down. Well, there's a legit business in the street. It, it'd be work. That's what I was trying to tell people. We don't. I didn't know that I was walking away from a spot that over probably twenty years, way over twenty million came through there. I don't know what the count would be. Well, you know what's the funny thing about it? I don't think about all the money because a lot of it did. I think about the guest appearance by all the people. All the people I got to see and meet, like from Channel 2, Channel 50, Channel 7. I just don't want to tell their exact names who used to cop from me. So many people I got to meet copping from, and they were actually nice people. It was fun doing business with them because it wasn't no riot up gangster shit. It was an honest business, and they were honest people. You ran the block right. You did. You ran, ran the block right. It wasn't, it wasn't no violence. It wasn't, I ain't allowed right. niggas to rob my customer. No, you ran your you spot rob, right. You couldn't rob my customer. No. That's like robbing me. Because <laughs> that's what you do if you rob us. Let's stand up here and let you rob my customer. You robbing me. And I just can't leave Troy without coming to French Road. Because the action is here. And Eddie, you know, one thing I say about Eddie, anybody who hustled with him been around him, you know. He got that from his father, honestly. When his bag is, when his pocket's right, he's a very generous person. So we back living the lifestyle that we're accustomed to. Um, six months later, the tragedy strikes. Oh, Demetrius. Demetrius. So, uh, let's pause there for a second. So, uh, without getting too sidetracked, I mean, Demetrius fell victim in that hole. Well, we won't get into what probably really was his demise because no one's been, well, the Milton brother, but then... It's but, still shades so, and foggy, right? So best friends is running around. 
White boy Wait, Rick, Rick is, is just getting around. knocked. Maserati, like this Big is Ed Hanson. In fact, oh Ed is still we out. Still, because that Ed was is, the the war was Ed and, and Demetrius. All oh, that's going down. So how? That's when Pops meets Ed. Mm. Well, oh, Pop and Ed in jail, but they had met over on Evergreen. But anyway, so how, how, same how, how did you? How did Eddie not get? I mean, was the violence really about the drugs and the money, or was it was just drug dealers who had personal problems with each other? Like, how were you guys not sucked in any violence? I mean, well, one, okay, so Eddie hustling with Demetrius. Demetrius, Eddie's man. Ed Hansen and my cousins, mm. Lala and them are doing. Oh, he, they're actually. We, they in business. Oh. And okay. and we didn't know to after the fact. Sometime we was copping from Ed, and sometime. They was getting shit from us. No, no, you would, people would be amazed for a spot that was this notorious and that, at least during the two big mm. runs that I saw, the run when you had Demetrius back and the run with my daddy, the Pakistani club, when, when y'all went to doing y'all thing. You're talking about a spot where every third car on a major street was a customer for you. You know, it was at really point, at, one, at point, one point. If three cars drove down French Road between 94 and Mac, one of them three was stopping the cop from you. Well, it was always at that time like, what were they Christmas time? It was what were the Christmas time? And Christmas despite time, of all that, you yeah. ain't never heard nobody here about again getting robbed. The only person who ever got shot on French Road was you. Me. You getting robbed. And Shell. Yeah. And Another girl got you killed. Some I bullshit. can't forget about Shell. Shell. God rest her soul. Yeah, I can't but forget about her. The block yeah. ate when you ate. And I mean, and, and we ain't just saying no like go for case. Anybody from there tell you, man, the man, all the picnics, you know, some days just because it was the right thing to do, we pulled the grill out. Feed the neighborhood. Anybody who came by could eat. Well, it that's what make you successful in the block. Not only you had to pull the grill out, you had to pull them greenbacks out <laughs> too. A lot of people like money. Everybody don't <laughs> like food. Man. You can't be cheap with the money. I told y'all, you can't have a closed hand. Your hand got to be open where you can get some shit in and let some shit go. So, you know, I'd be trying to explain this and things what your man Cavario was saying too. When you second generation in this shit. A lot of shit that people, you know to stay away from the nigga shit, man. For real. You see it a mile away. Just making money. You know there's about to be a bunch of bullshit, a bunch of killing, and you just already instinctively know we need to distance ourselves. We gonna be cool, I was telling big homie, big fella over there. Um, we ain't never got into no shit with nobody. That's why we sit outside on French Road right now, 20 years later, and then, because we knew to stay in, stay in our lane, and be cool with everybody, cause the bag, we were saying, the money was right, so if the money right, and we, you know, both was raised, and you ain't gonna take nothing from me, as long as you ain't trying to take nothing from me, you can talk as crazy as you want. We ain't, we not, we not gangsters, we hustlers. Which means, who can get gang? Who can get, but we gonna protect our interests. You know what I mean? Listen. Yeah. But ain't no, I ain't never, I ain't never. Wear some feelers around here. You might have had to get gangster. I mean, I can say, cause I ain't never even tried to pretend to be a tough guy. I just came up that you know, as long as you don't bother us, why we gotta be? What about security at a spot like that? Was there a rock and stick, or just it wasn't set up to where somebody? Well, could later stick it up? we get one. It was the one stick up attempt, which we'll get to. Oh, which was an attempt to stick up yeah. that actually happened. So, yeah, that was also, that's kind of the history of French Road, of course, and again, but just a quick rundown. So, we got our dear friend, whose name we can't mention, but love to you. You know who you is, and the crew know who you is, who started us off. No doubt. Then you got Demetrius come through. That was next. Uh, is before the old man and y'all hook up with the Pakistani plug, a quick bag from Wakefield? No, nah, after that came me and Al. That was you and Al? And remember, my man. So that that's Khalif. That's Khalif and that's Khalif. That's, that's Khalif Lee Kaka. Yes. Shout out to him, God. <coughs> I believe God may he rest in peace. Another real one. Another real one. That's what I'm telling you from about. From back all in the, the day. Appearances. Appearances. Years, years after this. So Demetrius gets killed. Demetrius gets killed. All fucked up. Um, and Dad is then locked up at this point. Demetrius gets killed because dad finds out about Demetrius why he locked up. Okay. He in Springfield. He so in you Springfield, got nothing, so nothing's going on. Nothing's going on. Um, in fact, I get so distraught with the situation. I'm like, fuck it, I do better. I can go back to New York and get a six-figure gig. Mm. 
Fuck it. Oh, because you had been managing the Gap in Harlem or something? All that, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Pops now is down to about six months mm. before he gets oh, down. So you're just going to buy I'm just, I'm just counting down. And you know Pop going to figure gonna out. Do something. Pop going to figure it out. Pop figured out. We'd be able to get back, you know, his network much bigger than mine and Eddie, you know. And we'd be able to get, once Pop come home, that was, yeah, that was, that was all everybody's back in the day. As soon as Pop get home, when Pop get home, things get a lot better. He ended up working with us. But yeah, so he was the only really. But yeah, we weren't making enough money to bother yeah, nobody yeah, who yeah. was about something. Yeah. And um, I went off and actually squared up, got a little powder hustle going, got a gig. Squared up means a job. A job. A job. It's because you had a college degree. College degree, you know, and a good resume. You know, I ran some big shit in New York. An upstanding young gentleman. An upstanding young gentleman. Paper. Because, you know, mom always insisted that I work. Hey, as she should. Right, because she would be like, even though the allowance, I literally for a lot yeah, of too years. Too much for a young man with all free time and money in his pocket is. She knew that was a disaster. Fast. Recipe for disaster. Fast. And that at least since his old, his old man's given him $3,000 a week allowance. The hell did you do with all oh, drugs? Drugs and women. Yeah. That's a lot Lifestyle. of money back then. That's my Plus, you were making your own money. Plus, I'm making, plus I'm working. You don't pressure me at all. He just, Jack, I give you credit, man. You know, you were bad, and you just was like, we like, we just going to fight it out till it get better. I decide I'm going to go. I'm going to let I'm gonna let it be. He he ain't said nothing. I just tell man, Jack, I got this opportunity out here in Troy fucking with these white folks. I'm going to go on and do that, you know, and try to maybe hustle me a little powder out there with them. And, and you know, I figure I'll make a way. Because I'm just looking, I'm figuring we got 18 months to go, old man, come home. And I'm figuring something will break before then. And you said, well, go I ahead. said in my mind, see, this is how he thinking. <laughs> in my mind, I'm saying, I'm going to go up here to the penitentiary that pops <laughs> and put a bug in his goddamn head. <laughs> I need some good work. That's right. So I made my way up to Milan. Because Pops, <clears throat> at that time, let me explain this to you. When you come in the system, you either going to come in at Milan and they're going to ship you out, then they bring you back to Milan before you come home. Pops was finna be shipped out again, or he was either there in court. As long as you go to court, you'll stay there. But after your court, all the, you know, uh, appeals and all that stuff, they're going to ship you out. So I shot up to Milan and put a bug in Pops' ear, and he said, you know what? I got a little boy out there doing good now, but you can't go over there and ain't fucking up. <laughs> now you understand? So this may be about, there. now this is what he was trying so, to figure out the timeline. Because the man you're speaking about is Demetrius Holloway. Exactly. Eddie, you know, to his credit, when I tell him right here, literally we're standing right there, and I tell him, man, I'm going to go on the square up. I can give me a good thing. They're gonna let I can run this restaurant because I'd already started putting in some applications. I was like, I got a good thing. They're they willing to hook me up out at the Marriott out in Troy on Big mm. Beaver. I was running the seafood restaurant out there. Oh, that became, what's it now? Um, oh, was it was a Joe Mirrors then? Before it was Shula's. You're oh. thinking about it, it became Shula's. Before that, it was called Stacy's. Oh. It was internally ran by the Marriott. Oh. And um, and we had the NBA contracts. It was a good deal. I got to meet Jordan and all kinds of people. Barkley, because they had the NBA and NFL contract at the Marriott. But anyway, so Eddie tell me, man, you should hang in there, Junior. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. I said, man, it just ain't enough for both of us, man. I was like, you, you'll figure it out. You're a hustler. You'll figure it out. I'm like, and I did. I believed he would figure it out. I didn't know it would all. Un I didn't know that I was about to walk away from a 50-50 partnership on a spot that over the next 20 years was going to gross $100 million. I did not know that that's what I was walk Perseverance. So I, I, I go off to the Marriott. I ain't lying out maybe 90 days later. I'm talking to my man, Rome. He said, so you heard what happened, right? I said, what you mean? He said, uh, they say your man Eddie hooked back up with one of his pops friend, this cat named Demetrius. So you and get to Demetrius blood. Right, so I walk away 90. So you maybe, the old man put you back with D, what? After six, seven months on French Road? You, it was within a year. 90, that was about the end of my two years of doing nothing. I was begging to get back in the game because I was running with our friend. Yeah. That's why I was running with him because Pops didn't want me in the game. So I'm going to be smart enough. I got another little plug. So I'm going to go to our boy and yeah. get it from him. And after all this shook down and ran down, I ran back to the penitentiary 
Look, pops, I'm ready to go. I ain't <laughs> got my head no straight. More. I ain't getting high no motherfucking more. I'm through with them goddamn 51s. Now turn me loose, goddammit. Now two weeks after that, he ran me around for two weeks. I ran every goddamn way you could run looking for Demetrius. I went out on nine mile to the clothing store. I went to the 19th hole. I went to his mother clothing store on Livinoy. He ran me every goddamn where he could for two weeks. And at that, about the end of two weeks, Pops called me that morning and said, you'll be at your mother's house about 12 o'clock this morning. That's 12 o'clock that afternoon. He called me about 9, 10 that morning and said, You'll be over at your mother's house about 12 o'clock this afternoon. And see, this go right into the story we was talking about with Black Butch the first time I got came from Demetrius. That's how it all came about. He came over to my mother's apartment on Bartledge, gave me the key, gave her the 10000 and that's the first well, time I ever got my no recollection, word. right? So now I'm I'm doing my thing out the way. You folks didn't left. I didn't you left. Didn't but I'm away. coming back. I would come by after work. Yeah, I'd come by the spot. Know, I, I tell don't you know. Nigga, I ran into no, you don't. Let me go let, let me tell you who you tell me. Another move. Brother Rome, because you know niggas talk. Yeah, Rome so fifty man, already man. talking. You know Rome, Rome when I catch Rome, I'm kind of feeling some kind of way because Rome knows something. Fifty knows something that I don't know. So, but niggas can't keep a secret. So, Rome tell me, he say, so damn, I know we got to hurry up and catch up to Eddie. I'm right behind. I mean, what, what, what you saying though, Rome? Rome, like, you ain't heard. So I got to kind of play possum. I'm like, what you, I mean, I ain't heard, but let's make sure we talk about the same thing. I trick Rome by acting like I have nobody to talk about, but don't know. And Rome said, because you know, his man, his daddy man, they gave him that bird. He got a key over there now. Oh, shit. Why wrong tell me that? Fridge Row wasn't going to be able to get rid of me again. <laughs> um, and so once D, so I done walked away now. I come running back to French Row. I'm like, for real, homie? Street's talking. It's what you going to do for your man? I ain't no bush. That was just pulled up. I'm just, I can remember like yesterday. I pulled up. How long did you last at the Marriott? About 11 months. Oh, okay. That, that was good, right? Yeah. yeah. That was good. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that was good. Um, I pulled back up on the spot. I'm like, Eddie, they told me you'd hook back up with D. He like, yeah, yeah, Junior. So I didn't even have to ask. He was like, what you want, man? He always did right It's a me. total drought at this time. Yeah. And this is the time my friend KH came by. Him and Harlem, they came by in a black Mercury McCoy. Now these boys hustling right road. around the block from you, ain't they? Oh, they had the nickel houses kicking ass, but they couldn't get no cane. He come over and say, Eddie, we can't get no cane. I said, well, how much money you got? He said, we got about $5,000. I said, well, you want some cane? He said, we want $5,000 worth. Can you get it? I took him right in the bedroom. We were standing in the front room. I took I him remember. in the bedroom. I had just broke a key down, and I opened the drawer. I had the whole key in the drawer. I pulled open the drawer, and I said, you want the five thousand? I had the scale right on top of that. Weighed out the cane, gave him the five thousand dollar worth. Put the rest of the key up. Later on that night, he was right back after they flipped. Let's cut to the chase. What you want? I said, like, man, I ain't really been doing nothing. Just give me an AP, man. He was like, bet. Come back. Come back in an hour. I got you. And he did. And what'd you do today? You sold it? Oh, you were selling powder? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Out at the hotel or yeah. Surround? Yeah. Okay. Mostly, mostly the hotel. But you know, I know people. Yeah. Partiers, no partiers. Yeah. And I was sniffing enough of this shit out. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so Demetrius, you know, and Eddie started making these fucking dimes that were the size of golf balls with that Demetrius plug. I mean, he so he was doing with Demetrius ten, fifteen thousand dollars a day in dimes. Now, when yeah. something has that volume of traffic, it's not uh, two hundred crackheads spending fifty dollars. I mean, it's a lot of people doing double ups, drug dealers coming and spending four or five hundred dollars, right? It was a hustlers. It was a simple hustler's dream. Moral of this story, though, mm -hmm. I didn't walk away from this. 50% partnership. But I done decided that I can't wait no longer for it to kick off. My partner puts the shit together. And now I'm looking at, and then you start making them, uh, now you start with, you, when the D, you went to dimes. You went to dimes. But the dimes, the boy that was putting out there was the size of a baseball. So it didn't take long. It didn't take long at all. Once yeah. you got that bag, French Road, 
It was it. Yeah. Number one crack house in the state of Michigan. <laughs> voted by the Detroit News and Free Press. No doubt about it. Street, it, it'd be work. That's what I was trying to tell people. We don't. I didn't know that I was walking away from a spot that over probably twenty years. The first time I got came from Demetrius. That's how it all came about. He came over to my mother's apartment on Barlidge, gave me the key, gave her the ten thousand, and that's the first yeah, time tell you I ever got my in recollection. Water. Right. So now I'm I'm doing my thing out the way. You folks didn't left. I didn't left. But I'm away. coming back. I would come back after work. Yeah, I'd come back. I, I don't know. No, you don't. Again, he put could you dime come and buy all dime? You could come and buy. But that would have just been neighbor. It was a. Most of the business was people buying. Me or Al? Oh, uh. <laughs> yeah, take my number. See? We just live on the block. Hey, Omari, I'll be calling you. Al. Text me. Sorry about that. Okay, All just right. shoot me a text. Okay. Yeah. It's real in the D. When you with a celebrity, two celebrities. Two. <laughs> now the question is, what does that young gentleman want to do? It doesn't yeah. involve a Rico violation. <laughs> <laughs>
at least during the two big runs that I saw the run when you had Demetrius back and the run with my daddy, the Pakistani plug, when, when y'all went to doing y'all thing. You're talking about a spot where every third car on a major street was a customer for you. You know, it was at really point, at, one, at point, one point. If three cars drove down French Road between 94 and Mac, one of them three was stopping the cop from you. Well, it was always at that time, like, what were they Christmas time? It was what were they Christmas time? And Christmas despite time, of all that, calling. you ain't never heard nobody here about again getting robbed. The only person who ever got shot on French Road was but you. Me, you getting robbed. And Shell. <laughs> and Shell got killed. Some bullshit. Shell. God rest her soul. Yeah, I can't but forget about her. But the Block yeah. 8, when you ate, and I mean, and, and we ain't just saying no, like, go for case. Anybody from there tell you, man, the man, all the picnics, you know, some days just because it was the right thing to do, we pulled the grill out feed the neighborhood. Anybody who came by could eat. Well, it that's what makes you successful in the block. Not only you had to pull the grill out, you had to pull them greenbacks out <laughs> too. A lot of people like money. Everybody don't <laughs> like food. Man. You can't be cheap with the money. I told y'all, you can't have a closed hand. Your hand got to be open where you can get some shit in and let some shit go. So, you know, I'd be trying to explain this and things what your man Cavario was saying too. When you second generation in this shit, a lot of shit that people, you know to stay away from the nigga shit, man. For real. You see it a mile away. Just making money. You know there's about to be a bunch of bullshit, a bunch of killing, and you just already instinctively know we need to distance ourselves. We gonna be cool, I was telling big homie, big fella over there. Um, we ain't never got into no shit with nobody. That's why we sit outside on French Road right now, 20 years later, and then, because we knew to stay in, stay in our lane, and be cool with everybody, cause the bag, we were saying, the money was right, so if the money right, and we, you know, both was raised, and you ain't gonna take nothing from me, as long as you ain't trying to take nothing from me, you can talk as crazy as you want. We ain't, we not, we not gangsters, we hustlers. Which means, who can get gangsters? Who can get, but we gonna protect our interests. You know what I mean? Listen. Yeah. But ain't no, I ain't never, I ain't never. wear some feelers around here, you might have had to get gangster. I mean, I can say, because I ain't never even tried to pretend to be a tough guy. I just came up that, you know, as long as you don't bother us, why we got to be What about security at a spot like that? Was there a rock and stick, or just it wasn't set up to where somebody Well, later, stick it up? we get one, it was the one stick up attempt, which we'll get to. Well, it's more than an attempt, the stick up yeah. that actually happened. So, yeah, that was also, that's kind of the history of French Road, of course, and again, but just a quick rundown. So, we got our dear friend, whose name we can't mention, but love to you. You know who you is, and the crew know who you is, who started us off. No doubt. Then you got Demetrius come through. That was next. Uh, it's before the old man and y'all hook up with the Pakistani plug. A uh, quick bag from Wakefield? No, nah, after that came me and Al. That was you and Al? And remember, my man. So Dick that's Khalif. That's Khalif in that clip. That's Khalif. That's, that's Khalif. Khalif. Lee yes. Kaka. Shout out to him. God. <coughs> Lee I Kaka believe. God gone. may he race, Lee Kaka rest in peace. Another real favorite. one. Another real one. That's what I'm telling you from about back all in the guest day. appearances. Years. Years after this. So Demetrius gets killed. Demetrius gets killed. All fucked up. Um, and dad is then locked up at this point. Demetrius gets killed because dad finds out about Demetrius why he locked up. Okay. He in Springfield. He so in you Springfield, got nothing, so nothing's going on. Nothing's going on. But you know, I ain't no big Ed and Demetrius have a few to uh, locked up with right. in the county jail. And Big Ed, <laughs> handsome, yeah. was was running with Speedy, Speedy yeah, and Cousin I Pam. I when when the, when the, the, the same time when we was doing the Bible Big thing. Ed house uh, about some jazz. He said, well, I got my, I know somebody knows about this, that brown shit. And he called me over, and it was on Evergreen. And I went over there, and he said, what is this shit here? I said, I don't know, I'm not hip to it, but I, I can test it for you and let you know what it is. And uh, I done a few things with him, then he got locked up again, and I told Big Ed, I said, you going to jail. He said, what do you mean? I said, you going to jail. I don't care what the lawyer tell you, you got caught with goddamn guns. I said, I don't know what you and Demetrius Spruit is about. I said, but they're going to wind up with nigga shit. I'm telling you that right now. We was in the county jail together. And I said, uh, I'm telling you right now, you're going to jail. And you and that Demetrius, that shootout shit y'all doing is for kids. But he I said, I don't know. I don't want to hear why, how come, who, where. I'm just telling you, big ass. 
Yeah, I call him Big Alcohol Red. I said, you going to jail, and something gonna happen when you and your family did shit out there for uh, Demetrius got, you know, fame. So I locked up there when it showed up. You was locked up when Demetrius got killed? Yeah. You got killed yeah. before you went No, out. I got locked up when I was in Springfield. I never, because came, I got the newspaper. Oh, I called somebody back. And you know, the crazy thing about the night before that, Eddie Jr. was running, because when I was Eddie Jr., man, and we was at the 19th hole. Yeah. I mean, like, 4 o'clock in the morning, I had, for whatever reason, I was driving, I had took him to see Demetrius. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next morning, he was supposed to go back to see him, and then mm -hmm. next thing, uh, yeah, we, we got, Broadway closed when we got And he had a gun on him. You know, look at Demetrius. Take him for instance. You see what I mean? How can you stop when the streets is calling? Demetrius Holloway and, and, and Rick Carter, even though they were friends, were as different as two human beings could ever be. Demetrius Holloway, had he wanted to be, could have been a CEO of a, a major corporation. He never drank. He never smoked. He laughed at people who used drugs. He was smart as hell. And he was cunning in a good way and in a bad way. But he was cunning in a good way, like great, like Bill Davidson probably was to build Guardian Industries. And he was a leader. See, a lot of these guys, that, that they, they lead in the wrong way and they lead in the wrong business. But that personality trait, if they were in the military, they'd be a guy to become an officer. Demetrius Holloway would have been an officer in the military. If he went to a regular business and started working, he'd come up with a better idea about how to do certain things. He was a leader of other human beings and he'd have wound up as a manager or a boss. Even though with guns, let, 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 and we talked on that Demetrius thing, you know, and God rest his soul. And, you know, I know that was your manny day, man. I only through you one time came across him. Um, but because this ain't just D, it's, it's all of them. my father, your father. But let's look, we speaking about Demetrius. You beefed out with all these guys in the streets. The feds is all over you. You sitting on multiple millions of dollars. Now, we can sit back now and say, if it's land like that, why don't you take the bankroll and go head on someplace in this world and go live your life? Why you still want to run around the streets of Detroit? You got millions of dollars, but you want to run around the streets of Detroit shooting at people and people shooting at you and, and the feds all on your neck instead of taking your bankroll and going to live you your life. Some of us get rush out of that here and get high. So obviously that was his rush. Gambling and beef and had to be as rush. So you're speaking of the addictive nature of the lifestyle. Man, they always say, once you kill one motherfucker, you're bound to be killing motherfuckers from now. Well, you know, Demetrius Holloway, obviously a whale, whale of a dealer. Um, Demetrius had met Eddie's old man and my old man, went at Milan. Eddie old man took Demetrius under his wing, introduced him to all the right people, and um, it's kind of like, you know, just like King Midas, as I was told, everything that he touched turned to gold. You know, and he hit the streets and he just blew up. I mean, and didn't just blow up. I mean, he started moving thousands of bricks. So anyway, you know, it's Eddie's father who had turned him on. And um, Eddie called him up and said he needed some money to do this, that, or the other. And um, we were waiting on him. And he calls, Eddie calls him up and, um, Demetrius is like, don't worry about it, little homie. I'm in your back door. Come out the back door. And we go out to the alley of Geneva. Um, I didn't know it at the time. It was Maserati Rick who was with Demetrius. Demetrius is driving. And he comes through the alley. He's got a shopping bag. Gives Eddie a shopping bag. It's like 82,000 bucks in it. Keeps it moving. He's just like, he handed him 82,000 like he was handing him $82. And he's just like, tell your pops I came through. You know, stay up, bro. If you need anything, just give me a shout. And uh, he kept going. And uh, yeah, that was like Demetrius was. He was. Um, he was like at his peak then. He was. He was. He was really moving the crowd then. Generous guy. Was very generous to his friends. Okay, the the switch lanes a little bit, and hopefully you don't mind going into sharing some of the stuff we be talking about when we ain't on camera. Oh man. He was talking about your father and the two men he left in charge. Uh, to kind of run things both times in the cases when he was locked up. And the one similarity they both had. Not getting high. And those two people were? Courtney Brown and Demetrius Holloway. Neither one have I ever seen get high, nor even take a drink. Both of them. 
Neither one got on. Now you think that was a coincidence? <laughs> I think he just felt they was responsible and when a motherfucker ain't getting high, you might <laughs> lean more towards them because you might feel they're a little more responsible. It don't always work out like that, but in this case it did. You know, he felt. You know, being like I tell you at the same time, you have to look at a lot of things when you choosing that motherfucker, he got to also be able to handle himself in the streets. If you're handling a hundred keys and I keep leading you to that, and motherfuckers get to sucking you out the bag and not paying tickets, it's going to lead you to hurting people. Because the money gets to adding up to be too much. <laughs> you talking millions of dollars, you get him a hundred thousand credit, he don't come in. You get him another forty thousand, he don't come in. Okay, I gotta play street credit now. A street advocate, devil's advocate. Well, I'm gonna keep feeding y'all, giving out credit. You're running off with the bag. And Not some, everybody. Right. Not everybody. Not everybody. Well, let's put this as that. One motherfucker hurts you, let's say big in. Okay. One motherfucker run off with enough to hurt you. Now, add up everything after that, and you really hurt. Some subscribe to it though. If, if I give it to you and you don't pay me, if you ain't fuck run off with a half a million dollars. Why you give him the half a million from the beginning then? Because he ran four other times and bought it back. Well. Now the fifth time he played me like a sucker that went off and act like he's that have go out to California and get his own connect and come back. But never say, well fuck it, I did all that, here go your money back, nigga, we ain't got the beef. Fuck that nigga, I ain't never paying you. And I got another connect. Fuck you, I ain't giving you shit. Now what you gonna say? Demetrius said went to, was just a regular guy. Demetrius, I think, went to federal prison for like robbing trains or mailboxes, some very low level, but yet still federal crime. And again, while he was locked up, um, he met Eddie's father and Eddie's father just thought the boy, which he would prove to be prophetic and true, that he was a smart kid and that he was just misdirected. And he, if he ever knew how the real big picture worked, this kid could be good on the streets. And um, Eddie's father vouched for him, schooled him, gave him some mentorship, and um, he turned him onto the plug. And again, and Demetrius becomes the biggest thing in the city for, you know, from the mid 80s to the late 80s when he gets killed. And, um, you know, he looked out for Eddie Swell. He looked out for Eddie Swell. And,. Um, you know, somebody should really do a project on them. There's been projects done on them, but those people didn't really know the inside, the inside story. And it was just crazy because, you know, that it was that whole best friends era. And unfortunately, people's egos and there was so much money floating around and the competition. But um, I didn't know Maserati. And again, the only time I really came in contact with Demetrius, my old man knew Demetrius because they had did time together. But um, when he came and dropped off that money to Eddie in Highland Park was the only time that our paths actually directly crossed. Um, and later I would hear about this guy, Maserati Rick, that worked for Demetrius or that was you know, hustling with Demetrius. But it was a different click. Um, I had some family that was dealing with another guy, Big Ed Hansen. Um, he also was running with Demetrius. But that was a whole little east side thing and those guys were they were making fortunes. They were, you know, everybody got beefed out with everybody. So we were, I had a front row seat to that show, but I wasn't directly participating in that, in, in that in that little street, uh, Detroit drama at the time. A little did I, later I would come to find out again, um, uh, you know, actually I was, but didn't know it because again, I had some family that was dealing with um, Big Ed Hansen who was dealing with uh, Maserati and Demetrius, you know, obviously, Demetrius was looking out for Eddie Jr. Um, and he was feeding a bunch of people who um, were very, very close to us. Demetrius loved to gamble, if you really know him, for those of you who really knew him. Demetrius loved to gamble. Demetrius would go to Las Vegas all the time and gamble, love it. At his funeral, the people from Las Vegas, in fact, came to his funeral. Demetrius would go to Las Vegas, he'd bet 50,000 that he could throw 11 on the first row. And he was good at it. Huckle Buck sit there and watched him pass for over $2 million. Then he turned around and gave the dice to a broad. She passed for another million, and he gave her 150000 So that night, 
Demetrius had damn near won three million that night and banked it there at the bank in Las Vegas. So anyway, moving right on along. You know when you're gambling big like that, people are watching. They watching the table, they watching these big bets, they watching you hit these licks. So it was some people down there that was from Texas. Huckabuck used to live in Texas down in Houston when he left Detroit in the late 70s and spent the 80s to the early 90s in Texas. So Huckabuck has some high-powered money-getting friends down there. <clears throat> and one of his money-getting friends, they were Latino because Huck used to fake like he was Latino. They was getting a lot of bricks. So Demetrius ran into them in Las Vegas. So what happened was Demetrius had finished gambling, banked the money, and started having a drink. And this particular broad, which they paid, which was fine, slid up on Demetrius and put some Visine in his drink. And the Visine knocked him out. So when D Demetrius, after he feel he's gotten dizzy, he don't know who hit him with it, but he felt it coming. So he's staggering, making his way up to his hotel room in Las Vegas. He's wearing a bunch of jewelry, a bunch of jewelry. Demetrius has some very sweet pieces. So when he makes his way up to the room, they got somebody already up there waiting on him to open the door and escort him on in. So when Demetrius wake up, he's butt-ass naked, all his money gone that he had in his pockets, not the money that he had just won because he banked that, but money that he had in the room, all that money was gone, and his jewelry. All that was gone, and he was butt naked, sleep on, laid out on the bed. When he come to, he butt ass naked. So uh, Demetrius knew these particular people was from Texas, but some other people Demetrius knew knew them and knew they was in Miami at this time. And so Demetrius grabbed the best friends, which was his team at that time, and they grabbed a motherfucking black van with the black tinted windows and went to Miami. And Demetrius went and caught the motherfucker who had, had the bitches give him a knockout drug and they cleaned him for his jury and shit. So when Demetrius then whipped up on him van, jumped up on him and whopped, put him in the van, and they finna close him out, the first thing the niggas started hollering, wait, 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 I know Huckabuck. Do you know Huckabuck? Do you know Huckabuck? So... Demetrius know Huckabuck. Huckabuck is well known in the city of Detroit. So Demetrius said, yeah, I know Huckabuck. What about it? He said, look, man, if you call Huckabuck out here, Huckabuck will stand for me. I will go get everything I took from you, and I will bring it back to you. Please don't kill me. Demetrius looked at this motherfucker and said, okay, I'm going to do just that. They sent the money to Western Union. Huckabuck bought the ticket, came right out there to Miami. Went, stood for my man. Huckabuck, Demetrius explained to Huckabuck before my man left, Huck, you my man, you from Detroit, but if he don't come back, I'm going to I'm gonna have to put him in you because you're standing for him. Huck said, Demetrius, I know his fam. I know them personally for years. He coming back, man. I guarantee you he bringing all your shit back. 45 minutes later, that boy bought all of Demetrius' shit back, money, jewelry, everything, and said, hey, man, please, let's, no beef, please, I apologize. I truly apologize. Please, no beef. Demetrius said, okay, no beef. Come to find out later on, Huck a Buck arranged for him to get a package from his people as a makeup. So Demetrius started getting keys from them in Texas. He got about two or three packages from them, and the cane was good as a makeup for him not killing whoever he was to the big man. And that's how that story went. Eddie hook up Demetrius with the Colombians? That, that I do believe to be the truth. The plug, you know, um, he definitely vouched for him, and um, it was told to me the connection that, that allowed him to really take over the town he got he got that plug through Eddie. Uh, I mean, Eddie, Demetrius didn't come from that world. He didn't know any of those people are definitely at that level. So it would take somebody of Eddie Jackson's stature to kind of vouch for a guy with no past reputation to say, this guy represents me, give him the bag. And he did, 
And they did give him the bag, and Demetrius handled it right. And again, you know, he became the biggest thing in this. That is what we. That is what um, I've been told by very reliable sources that the arrangement was basically he got a thousand keys at a time, and he had to pay for 660 of them. So that means 340 were on the house. They give him. They were giving him a thousand bricks. He pays. He has his ticket is for 640 of the bricks. The the other uh, what's that? 360 are his. Uh, so, I mean, do the math there. Do you know what his price was? No, nah, but he had to be getting them for shit. 10, I mean, 11, 11,000. I mean, he was letting them go for 13, between 13 and 15, depending on who you were. He had to make his money on each. So, I, you know, and, and again, I, I know that, you know, in New York and then with Mr. Q, big fellas were, big fellas were all in between like that 11 and 13,000 range at that point. But when you're getting a thousand at a time, I mean, I can't speak with authority on that. But if 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 you could get thirteen five and you're getting twenty at a time, what's your price if you're getting a thousand at a time? You got to figure he's somewhere around eleven, eleven five, ten. No, Rick, Rick, Rick was the opposite. Rick was cheap and petty. I mean, he was all right to deal with, but he he, he was he wasn't all right to deal. He was a pain in the ass, is what he was, and. Uh, he liked to flaunt stuff, you know, and walk around like he was a big shot, which I, in a sense he was, I guess. But uh, he was, it was apples and oranges, him and Demetrius. Anybody will tell you that. Anybody in the streets will tell you that. But they knew each other from childhood. Oh, yeah, they, they grew up together. I'm saying they were close. I mean, I don't know if they were close because I wasn't with them, you know, away from. But they at least knew each other. Don't oh, they? yeah, they were, they were, they, it was, I used to say to meet you all the time, Jesus Christ, did you guys live down the same street? What, did you have a different kind of. Water in your house than, than, what, than Rick? Street, do you know what street those guys were? They, I think they lived in the Brewster Projects. I think Demetrius came up in the Brewster Project. That's what I think. I don't know. His mother worked for the post office. Um, what case cases did you do for Demetrius? Every case he got from the day. Demetrius Holloway walked in my office in 19, I want to say 85. He, he died in 90, probably 80, 85. He walked in. I was still in the Lafayette building. He said he had a Fed case, felon in possession. He had just gotten out on bond. I was going to say he just got out. And he had just got out of jail, out of prison, federal prison. Yeah, he had just he got out in 85. And he had just got out on bond. And he came in and he said, look, I, I, I'm going to try this case. I've got a defense, which he did. I don't have any money, hardly. You know, I've got, I mean, some 500 bucks, whatever it was he had. But my word's good. He says, I'll, I'll, you tell me the fee. It'll take me some time, but I'm going to pay, I'll pay the fee. And he was, at the time, literally had just gotten out of jail on federal parole. And there was something about the guy. I can't remember if it was drugs or breaking into boxcars. He used to. I can't remember. I don't think it was drugs. I'm almost positive it wasn't drugs. So he got in '85 when he got out. He was not at that point a drug kingpin. He was nobody. I'm telling you, he didn't have anything. He had a thousand dollars or five hundred dollars, and there was something about the guy. I thought he was telling the truth, and it was and it was a tribal case, and I'm a sucker for trials. And I said, okay, we got a deal. And of course, this jackass examining me today was saying, you didn't have a fee agreement. So yeah, we had a fee agreement. We shook hands. And we tried the case, and he was found not guilty, Judge Woods. And he did exactly what he said he would do. He brought in, ba -dum, ba -dum, and then he paid the fee. And then as time went on, he only had, um, he had a little misdemeanor case, which was just literally cussing in front of kids, so I wouldn't even call that a case. That's just a ticket. He had one other drug case where the, the, the Detroit police planted some drugs out. There was no, I, I proved it. The jury was out five minutes. Ten minutes. Where do you remember where that was at? Yeah, it was in uh, where the heck was he driving? It was down. It was near downtown. I think he was coming from his mother's. You know, I can't remember. We had the map too, because we used the map to show how full of shit they were. We had the map. We had we had so much evidence. It was unbelievable. And that, I, I, later on, I found out it was true that they planted it. Well, the, the facts were pretty obvious. This was by this time he's Demetrius Holloway Whale, and they claim he's driving down the road. I think it was down by the Fox. They followed him a ways, maybe on Bagley. I think, yeah, he was coming from the projects and was somewhere around over there. And they claimed he had like an eight ball on him. Now, this is a guy who doesn't use drugs, which I know for sure. He's a whale. What whale is driving around with it? it I mean, it might have been heroin. Twelve dime bags of heroin or something like that. It was some ridiculous. Now, of course, you can't really defend. It's Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, he's, he's this guy is a whale. He yeah. has kilos. <laughs> but we did get out that they had one. They knew. You know, this was still when there was recorders, court too, so you had a, you know, a more streetwise jury. They knew he was somebody to the police because that was part of the defense. 
It had to be. Because when people want to use a defense of police planted it, the first question anybody asks, including me, why? Well, there was a why. This was Demetrius Holloway. And that jury, they were out 10 minutes, literally. They didn't let him go. That's the only other case. They were working on a federal case when he got killed. What, uh, what did you think when he got... You shocked him. Okay. <coughs> Other than when the you heard he was killed at the Broadway, what did you I was, I'll never forget where I was at the gas station. This is before cell phones. And I got a message from Joe Swicker, who still writes for the Free Press, and he was covering the courts at that time. And I called back from the payphone. That's just how long ago it was. And he tells me that he got killed at the Broadway. I knew he went to the Broadway all the time. Obviously, so did the killers. What did I think? I thought within two hours, certainly by the next day, I. Knew who did it and why, but nope, I'm no. not going to say. <laughs> oh well, if you say so, yeah. Well, that's who. But nobody knew. Nobody. They, they chased that their tails on that case for what, 15, 15 years? Yeah. They, the, everybody in the street knew who did it. And everybody knew who ordered it, and everybody knew why it happened. Who ordered? I'm not talking about <laughs> that. They know though. They know. They know for sure. I mean, is it somebody that's around? Or? He's alive. But they they know. Oh, Ed, Big Ed or something. No, 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 no. It had nothing to do with him. Did you have any ever cross paths with Big Ed? Never once. He and Demetrius, at least anecdotally, were at war all the time. And Maserati. Well, Rick, Rick was dead. Yeah, because yeah, Ed sent the guy to kill him, supposedly, right, yeah. in, a, in a hospital. What case did you do for Maserati? Pistol case outside the, the uh, skating rink over there on the east side, because he was the east side guy. Didn't you say he gave you a leather jacket or something? Yeah, he, a coat, because uh, he owed me money. I won the case, and that's why I say he was cheap. It was a I mean, it was a pistol case. He probably owed like three grand or something like that, and the damn guy would not pay. And it was always, I'll see you next week. So I typed up a motion to withdraw. He had another case pending, and I typed up a motion to withdraw. And I called the guy in that was from the east side. I said, "Take this thing." I wasn't filing it, but I I said, t t "Tape this thing to the walls and the windows, like at the bars, everywhere on the east side, so people can see what a cheapskate Rick is." And and the guy went out, and about two days later, man, what are you doing? I said, well, should you go and come in and bring me the money? And so he brought me a leather coat instead, <laughs> which was fine. He but, paid you the leather coat. But I, he brought the, he might have brought the money and a coat. Maybe that's what he did. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. Yeah. But I, I gave the motion. The guy said, go, go hang this up on the east side somewhere. Let's see. I'll, I'll get his America attention. America refused to release the identity of the man found shot at the Broadway clothing store. The friends and relatives of Demetrius Holloway gathered quickly after word of the shooting spread through the city. They come running out, and it's raining out. And I said, where's the key? Where's the key? I said, well, hold on a second, sir. I'll get you the key. No, I want the key right now. Exactly. But I was tell it, you why was it played out like that. It wasn't because he owed anybody. It was because motherfuckers owed him. You keep missing the point. That shit adds up. One motherfucker alone is a half a million. I count other motherfuckers. Wrong. The fireman bought a brand new Corvette with your shit, told you, fuck you, and sit right there in your goddamn money and car. You just gonna, them motherfuckers just gonna fuck you and tell you anything. If they're smart enough, they talk. So now once you get to that way, they ain't gonna even talk about it. They're just gonna slap you like a bitch and take it. Now we ain't even gotta ask you for it no more and something you not pay you. We just gonna catch you and take it from you. For real? No, no, no. I'm, I'm just saying. In, 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 you don't in, remember when a motherfucker told my man, I'm going to fuck your woman and you? You don't remember that shit? I mean, you know what our people did to him when they told him that. So that's what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> did he have to do that? He did. I, I no, did. he had to do that? That man, went over no money. That, he didn't owe him a quarter. No. Did he have to do that? The man threatened his family. And no. A motherfucker took a half a million dollars. Now, nah, he said he was going to fuck you and your woman. Now, nah, you're going to defend your goddamn half a million dollars just as well as you're going to defend you and your woman's ass. <laughs> Now let's get real. I mean, that's serious. It's just as serious as a motherfucker running off with a half a million dollars. It's just as serious. I can't say a motherfucker that I'm gonna fuck you and your woman. Bro, that's just as serious as a nigga running off with my money. Cause he really let me know what he think of me. I'm a real bitch. So now his next step. Well, the commonality both. Man. Well, the one that ran off with the half me is still alive, but the one who talked that slick shit to our people, they are resting with the uh, 
<laughs> they have their rest they got how to get they're pushing goes. up Daisy's now. You see, that's what yeah. I'm saying. That's how the game goes. Yeah. It turned out, yes, he got got. But a whole lot of motherfuckers went with him. That's one motherfucker thing he could say. He did not go by himself. God damn it, he put a lot of company right down there with him. So he joined a whole lot of motherfuckers he put down there. So for his one life, goddamn, let's say 40 to 1. His odds wasn't bad. If we was in a war in wartime, goddamn it, 40 to 1, you did pretty well. Right if, if, if you could go back in time, would you have suggested? Now, of course, we don't know when you do something. You can't do that. The king makes those decisions. They said, look, man, you're ahead of the game. In this game, you're not going to beat the feds and keep ducking these niggas trying to kill you. It's time to pack it up and go. The king makes those decisions. So Demetrius gets killed. Demetrius gets killed. All fucked up. Um, and Dad is then locked up at this point. Demetrius gets killed because Dad finds out about Demetrius why he locked up. Okay. He in Springfield. He so in you Springfield, got nothing. So nothing's going on. Nothing's going on. Um, in fact, I get so distraught with the situation. I'm like, fuck it. I do better. I can go back to New York and get a six-figure gig. Mm. Fuck it. Oh, because you had been managing the Gap in Harlem or something? All oh, that, yeah, yeah. And Pops now is down to about six months before he gets oh, so down. So you're just going to buy I'm just, it. I'm just counting down. And you know Pop gonna figure gonna out. Do something. Pop going to figure out. Pop figured out. We'd be able to get back, you know, his network much bigger than mine and Eddie, you know. And we'd be able to get, once Pop come home, that was, yeah, that was, that was all everybody used back in the day. As soon as Pop get home, when Pop get home, things get a lot better. So I go back to New York. Um, so that's 91. Eddie starts coming to New York to get a bag. Ooh. Got it. You heard us talk about another big head. That big head, handsome big head from New York. Shout out to Big Head from the Bronx. Ran a nightclub, Indigo Blues. that had all the comedians. Cheryl Underwood, T.K. Kirkland, J.B. Smooth, Mike Epps. All the ones that we Smooth would end up... goes back there first. All the ones we would end up bringing to the Cotillion Club. We run into him in New York. So I'm living in the Dominican neighborhood. Eddie Stark coming to New York. I introduced him to some of the Dominicans I'd have met. Plus we got a brother out the Bronx. Shout out to Money Walt down in Florida. Um, Money Walt had hooked us up with a brother from the Bronx. He was plugged into a big Dominican Puerto Rican uh, clique. So Eddie Coppin from the Dominicans and from Big Ed running the shit back to French Road. I'm living in New York. Pop come home, he hook up with the Nigerians. He sat down while he in Springfield. Mm. More. Oh, before the Pakistanis, he had some Nigerians. Well, it was that uh, Marlon, a uh, guy named Ota, and uh, go ahead, we Ota, and uh, we uh, worked in the kitchen together. And, you know, we took up a conversation, and like everything else in jail prison, everything go through the grapevine. And he had heard that by through reputation or by repeating things that I was a big man in Detroit with my friend Eddie Jackson, and we moved a lot of weight and so forth and so on. So he was get, he got out before I did. But he left me his address and telephone number to get in touch with him. And I left him with mine. So sure enough, we get out, I get in contact with him. And uh, we set up the contacts. I sent some friend girls of mine over to Nigeria. Wait a minute, dog. Let's, let's slow it down for a minute. Now, about what year is this? 19, let me see, 84, I got out in 84. This had to be, the hospital had to be 1990. Had to be 1990. So you didn't you didn't run into Otai at Springfield after your, um, you ran into him at Milan? I'm trying to think now, now that I go back on it, uh, Springfield, that's where it was. I was back in the hospital. So this is right after your run, right after your run with um, Mr. B down in the islands, you had got a gun violation, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the gun violation, the 18 months they sent you to Springfield, Missouri. Yeah, Missouri, yeah. That's where I met Old Town. 
and Ota, that's what you're saying, you and Ota had. So that'd be 1990, 1991. So he got out before you, he got out of Springfield before, before you? He got out yeah, before I did. And anyway, we left for exchange numbers. It had to be 1990 and 91. But anyway, we got in contact with, he told me if I could get him or his people X amount of dollars, he could make some move. Of course, I, I did. I raised up 50000 I sent two friend girls of mine over there to Nigeria, the capital. And they gave him the money. Then we met his people in the islands. So first time you send the crew to Nigeria, yeah. they bring back the package. No, they, they pay, gave them the money. They gave them the money in And told them we would meet them in the islands. Uh, I can't think which one. It was Antigua, wasn't it? Yeah. And we met over there. The guy brought the package in a suitcase. It was, you know, concealed, mm -hmm. yeah, a briefcase. Concealed in the briefcase. Would you say the Nigerians were as good as anybody when it came to smuggling? Yeah, they they had mastered the smuggling game real good. Cause you never would even know if anybody didn't tell you. Dogs couldn't spell it. Nothing. It cleared through custom like it was nothing. What about the quality of their product? Now the quality of the product was not as good as the Italians. Or later when I started dealing with the Pakistanians, when as good as theirs. But it was a good quality. It was a good quality, but it wasn't no the same way. So, 92, the fame Chicago situation. Now fast forward, we're in 92. So we just did a story about that. His father was told by a Pakistani friend of his that an Iranian friend of his had 10 kilos of untouched premium turkey when sitting in suitcases in a hotel or in somewhere in Chicago that they were afraid they might be being watched. They went and kind of staked it out Nothing, didn't see any surveillance, picked it up, boom. So he hasn't told you at this point how um, much, no, he ain't told me how large the package how, is? How large the package was. Okay. And I didn't ask him, he didn't pay. So he kept calling me. No, he said, gotta get him to Canada. So I said, uh, yeah, uh, give me a couple of days. So then we met again and he says to me, uh, have you, uh, Thought about it more. I said, yeah, I said, but I still don't feel comfortable yet. So he said, well, you can you get me to Canada? I said, yeah, I'll get you by the take you over there. So when he gets over there, he calls me again a couple of days later and say, uh, what do you think? I said, I'm trying to run around up a crew now. I said, but I still don't know. But anyway, make a long story short, we finally got together. I said, all right. Uh, he said, I'm going to send you his street, the address, everything. He says to me, uh, tell your people, take everything out to the apartment or wherever it is, all the clothes and suitcase. I said, all right. And he never mentioned it. And then when he hung, got ready, hung up, he called me back again and said, now, brother, it's 10 kilos. I said, what? He said, it's 10 kilos. Uh, so let's, let's help the people out here. At this time, what's one? What's the price wholesale of one kilo? A hundred thousand. Okay, so wholesale you got ten. It's a million dollars wholesale. Mm -hmm. You break down one key. What what you retail it on the I streets? Was, uh, going about eighty thousand a key. Cause I break down for big. I had a hit. I can make three kilos, four kilos out of one. So, talking about four million dollars worth of them. Okay, go on. So he tells you then. He didn't call you, y'all didn't talk, you told him you got a crew ready to make a move. Yeah. Then he finally tells you that it's 10 keys, that yeah. is, is what you actually yeah. picked up. And he said, we take out all the friends, so I got a crew, a white guy, and a, and a friend, girl I messed around with, her brother. And then one of a guy named George. So we drive over to Chicago, separate cars. So I said, we're going to have a meeting place. And I find the place where you talk about the address. So I tell myself, I said, wait well, night because it was a mixed neighborhood. It wasn't no all black neighborhood. It was a mixed neighborhood of Jews, foreigners, and all that. So I tell the guys with me, I say, we wait the nighttime and make a move. The white boy tells me, Mr. Brown, we get it now. 
So I said, get it. Now it's just daylight. So yeah, I don't see no police around. So I said, all right. I said, y'all go. I said, get all the clothes. Don't be nothing. Just get the clothes, the suitcases and stuff. That's it. I didn't tell them what was in it, nothing. And we had passed a couple of gas stations. I said, we come, we'll all be back at this gas station when y'all can pick up the thing. So it showed up, it picks up the package, bring the car, they hand me one of the suitcases or something. And they had some clothes. I remember I gave them $500 a week before then. The $500 it was in his jacket. So I told him to keep the $500 and I'll meet you back in Detroit. So I get back to Detroit, I takes out the legs. Okay, I mean, they was in a, what I call a pound? They were cricket balls. Cricket balls. They were in cricket balls. I mean, like cricket ball. Inside, you had to break the cricket paint on. So we get back to Detroit, I go to the apartment, I takes out. And I say, hey, for five keys, he must have made a mistake. So just how he calls me. He said, what happened, brother? I say, uh, I got the package. I say, but there's only five. He said, no, he said, it's in the suitcase. I said, suitcase? I ain't got the suitcase. Guy, one of the guys that was with me, <laughs> he took the suitcase with him with the clothes in it. So again, let's talk to people here. You got a guy <laughs> who has got a net worth of $10. He's riding around with $2 million worth of dough. <laughs> he doesn't even know. He, he just, just blew. yeah, he's, okay, so. This, the guy who's riding around with the two million dollars worth of shit comes back to him, where his buddy comes back to him, yeah, look, look, looking look, to look. spend twenty bucks. Yeah. And so you, we, tell him, you tell him, you tell him what he We come back. I say, where's uh, Donald? He said he's looking for a thing. He said he was coming, but he told me. I say, tell Donald the people want want their client. To this day, they never knew what they had. <laughs> to this day, I said to him, I said. Go tell Donald to put their damn clothes. Bring that damn suitcase over here. So show up you come bring the suitcase. <laughs> and I, so I tell my man, my man called me again. He said, is it there? I said, yeah. I said, but I don't see it. He said, it's inside the suitcase. You got it. Man, showing up, I knew it was all power. Showing up, when I counted it out, it was five keys. So I told him, it was fan. And that was October the 22nd. I never forget it. So, by the way, the carrier, I asked uh, the girl who I was with, my brother said, what do you think I should give the guys for bringing the thing? She said, give them $500. I said, no, I can't do that. I tell the three of them, George, the white boy, and Don. I told them, I didn't tell them, to this day, they don't know. I said, You told them some jewelry, jury, didn't you? Huh? Then you just, the funds from the jewelry. Yeah, some jewelry, some shit I told them. I say, I'm going to give each one of y'all $25,000 a piece. They say, what? I say, I'm going to give each one of y'all $25,000. As soon as I flip the span, I'm going to give y'all $25,000. You know them guy I gave, I did. And about a month, I flipped shit, some of them so fast, I gave them $25,000 a piece. You know, by Christmas, they were broke. <laughs> okay, they somebody, were, that, that 10, that 10. And How long does it take you to send Muhammad? A million dollars. A million dollars. I million dollars. By March or April, I had sent him a million dollars. It's kind of like I was that. sitting on six. I was sitting over a half a million dollar cash myself. But because I spent and done whatever I did, I was sitting on half a million dollars from that one deal. That one deal. It was kind of like a line from the Snoop song. I got front of some. I got front of some keys and I got back on my feet and everything that nigga said came to reality. So I remember because the, the yeah, flip side, I was in New York. Yeah. And you you won't even remember, but so but I was in New York. You had just got back from Chicago mm -hmm. and I called you just to say hi. Mm -hmm. And I just you could tell the people's voice when something's changed. And you said, Junior, don't worry about nothing. Yeah, oh yeah, I remember yeah. And I just was like, okay, I won't worry about nothing. Yeah. And then you repeat it again. He said, No, I mean, don't worry. Yeah, your about mother told me you were to go in business and shit. About nothing, right. And then, you know, when I, I so I had to, of course, you know, being nosy, I had to run back home and see what the what the hell popping back up was popping back at home, man. Yeah, and then um Because she said you wanna go in business. Yeah. And I pay your rent and all that, and I would give her the money she was 
Yeah, we'd go shopping in, in Harlem. Uh, yeah. Harlem. Back in the day, let's go. I'm thinking this is about um, early 90s. You running around as you had always been running around. Um, we came across a click um, in New York. You were, I was living out there at the time. You were coming, you was doing your thing back and forth. Uh, you had, by fate, and you can go into the story, we had came across this Dominican Colombian crew that was plugged in. And uh, why don't you take it from there? Well, it started off like this. I used to cop from this guy, Kid Cuba. And I had went and copped a half a key. And me and a friend of mine, Mr. Craig Johnson, we leave there and we take a left turn at Central Park and we get stopped by the police with the whole half a key sitting on the back seat in the, in an Adidas box. I mean, we surrounded by three police officers and I just know we done. I'm ready to, to, to grab the cane and jump out the car and run through Central Park and splash it through the air and fuck it, what they get is what they get. <laughs> but, so happened Mr. Johnson calmed me down, said he please, don't do that, just, just sit here and wait. And we sat there, waited it out, and we lucked up, we got out the whole arrest. We had a half a key in the box of an Adidas, in an Adidas shoe box on the back seat. The whole arrest with three cops got us surrounded and everything. So I was just reminiscing about that and that took me to the time when I left there. I went back to cop after, they had beat me out of nine ounces. The half a key wasn't worth but nine ounces. I got back to Detroit and cooked the whole goddamn half a key up. I got nine ounces out of 18. They had beat me out of half of the goddamn cane. And at this point, this is a crack house. At this point, it's a crack house. Ain't no heroin been sold. Ain't no heroin been sold. But that's all about the change. It's all about the change, because for about six months now, Pops is coming to New York, Eddie's still running back and forth. They hooking up, but they ain't doing no business. Because Eddie got this cocaine thing going, and he's in his own world. And I'm telling him, and Pops telling him, dude, you're tripping. We got a good bag. So he didn't Oh, he's refused. He don't even want to. You know, he's like, man, I'm just doing cane, I'm just doing cane, I'm just doing cane. So when I went back the next time to New York to cop, I went to this other hot spot that I used to go to down on Broadway in 155 or somewhere up in there. And I used to cop from a guy named Eddie down there. And so happened I got down there and his crew was down there, but he wasn't there. They said, I tell you what, I'll take you to the cocaine factory if you pay me. I said, man, are you serious? He said, man, if you pay me, I take you where they getting the cocaine from. It's about Frank knocking them. Because heroin's a little more of a hat. Like it a is little, a hassle. Yeah, it is a hassle. So Eddie's making easier. Craig, you could have cook, cook it up, cut you it up, it sits, whatever. You ain't got to mix. You ain't got to worry about the right mix. You, again, it's the east side of Detroit. So when you come, they with want a, it. With a, but you got to come with the right blow because there's a lot of blows on the oh, yeah, in the neighborhood. Yeah. So it's you got it's an operation, right? I said, okay, man, I need it. Let's go. They took me over to 126 and Lenox Avenue to an apartment building, and they had two motherfuckers in there. It was two of the realest motherfuckers I ever met, Pablo and Crazy. The cop, first of all, they had to take you into this room with a wall full of flowers and. And, and, and incense, everything burning and all that, and they said Santa Maria. They Santa right. Maria. They used to take Maria. you in there, and if you they seen the police, you was through. <laughs> if they didn't, you was finna get some of the best cocaine you ever seen in your life. They cocaine when I put twenty eight in, thirty come back, and I'm not talking about whip. I'm talking about straight drop. I had to investigate and find out because I couldn't believe why this cane was coming back 30 grams when I would only drop 28 in. I came to find out, find out it was 101% pure. It was more than 100% pure. And that's how good that cane was. I mean, it was top flight. Some of the best cane I ever had from anybody came from them. So Pablo and Crazy and that was my connect. The Colombians, Pablo and Crazy had told us don't ever come on the block crazy. if we crazy. Crazy, because crazy, crazy mind. That was the one that I told you, Santa, the Santa, made us do the Santa Maria test. Oh, Santa Muerte. Yeah, we went to the spot through a friend unannounced, and he crazy freaks out. Because they was like, there's a big weight spot. Like, they kept 50 bricks mm. there. And we show up, two black guys unannounced on 127th and Lennox. 
Oh, that's Harlem. Oh. That's not even Washington Heights. That's what our man, our Dominican man, shout out to Kid Cuba and, and that crew. He tell us. That's how he hooked us to go. Because we used to just, he used to serve us right there. I was at 106 in Manhattan. He was at 107 in Manhattan. They owned the bodega. And we used to do the deal there. But he said, he didn't have nothing. And he said, go see my people. And we like, we ain't going over. He said, and that was his line. He said, it's 127 in Lenox. It's Black Harlem. It's your people. Y'all gonna be good. Eddie being Eddie, he like, fuck it. What were you, well, how much money did you have? Like, what were you trying to buy? Just a brick. Just a brick. Just a brick? Yeah. What yeah. was that going for then in New York? 14? Like 18? Like 18? On the street, though. Yeah. You're well, just we, walking up, like, yeah, hey, just, we, want, we got $18,000. Well, like, let me get one. Yeah. And um, I'm like, Eddie, why, every time, Eddie, Jane, Mike, and I'm thinking to myself, you're about to get me killed. Why does this guy always put me in life threatening? positions you know but anyway we go up to the spot on 127th and Lennox as soon as we walk in the big fellas Pablo and crazy they looking at our man here Cuba like are you crazy bringing these two niggas here and they just everybody start speaking Spanish and freaking out and everybody start moving and I'm thinking to myself this isn't good whether we go to heaven or hell Eddie I'm killing you after you get me killed cuz I'm just really I'm like I'm I'm all jokes aside I ain't gonna even lie I was scared as fuck because I'm really thinking to myself, 50-50 50, 50 chance. Oh, wow. I, I gave us, at that point when they all freaked out, I was like, we got about a 50-50 chance of walking out of here. So crazy didn't say, he, he look at the big boss, Pablo. Oh, and this is your first, you, you didn't know them. Did not know these guys from Adam House Cat. He said we gotta, he gotta go talk to the spirits. He start lighting the candles, pulling out the cards, Steaming up the mirror. I mean, this whole thing. I mean, was he afraid you were the police? That's what he was. That's what he oh. told us. He said he had to go talk to the spirits to find out if we was the police. Now we all know what the outcome was gonna be if the spirits had gave him. Oh, you think they would have killed two police who they thought to be police officers? Oh, I'm pretty sure. I know we weren't leaving there. <laughs> we weren't leaving. No, they was they was mad at the motherfucker about that man. They was mad at they man Cuba for bringing us up there for real, for real. Like you have compromised all security just so you can make $1,500, for real. So I don't know if they was more mad at him than they was at us, yeah. but we was, we was gonna he be was the gonna collateral. Bear the we was gonna be the collateral damage yeah. for his zealousness. But the spirits told crazy <laughs> that we was actually righteous guys just trying to make some money and do good business. And he came back and told Pablo, he said, oh, poppy good, poppy good, poppy good. Negro, negro poppy good, negro poppy good. Wow. Negro Papi, Delico Mucho. Negro Papi, good. That's all I remember. Your new nickname, Negro Papi. Negro Papi. <laughs> Negro Papi, good. <laughs> they served Eddie. They gave him the break. Told him, we got you. And then ain't nothing, but they gave him one thing. If we not here, don't do any business. Just leave. They gave me a key to come into the apartment building, and I was to go to a certain apartment. Everything was on camera. You take the key, you go to the apartment building. It was working fine. I go to the apartment, I sit there, I wait. 10, 15 minutes, Pablo or Crazy gonna come to you. This particular day I went there, waiting, looking for Pablo and Crazy. Now, it's my fault, because I didn't listen to what them people, what Pablo and Crazy told me from the beginning. If I'm not here, leave, come back again. If I'm not here, don't do any business. I broke that rule, which is a cardinal sin and a mistake. I went to dealing with this other motherfucker who walked in an apartment named Frankie. Mistake from the motherfucking beginning. They already told me, but here I'm running past and I'm thinking that all at the same time. I'm going crazy. Told me don't fuck with nobody else. But he coming in here trying to serve motherfuckers like they used to. So I took a chance. I gave the motherfucker my money, and he kept it all motherfucking day long. I seen him at 12 o'clock that afternoon. The motherfucker kept my money so long, I goes back over to Junior's house, come back, trying to make the motherfucker think I almost got a pistol. The motherfucker to give me my half a key. Soon as I walk out the goddamn door, a motherfucker waiting out there with a gun, give it up, Holmes. I looked at this motherfucker, I threw the goddamn half a key all the way over there to the goddamn sidewalk, and I just walked straight ahead. I just tossed the half a key all the way over there. I just walked straight ahead down to the car. Craig sitting right down there in the car, watching everything that happened. He ain't got no gun, so I know I'm hit. 
I just walked the fuck on down to the car. I just been robbed for a motherfucking half a key. Just that clearly, that quick, just like that. I got robbed for half a motherfucking key.